again and welcome to Man's Talk. I'm Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. She has the hat on, but I probably should have the hat on. Oh my god, it's like I I'm in this oh. middle stage. Like I'm trying to let it grow a little bit so that when I go to get it cut, she has more to work with. Right. And then yeah. it's just static and the, the wind and uh, well, so clearly I, I was excited, but I think somewhere with it's the fun. hat, you get a, the, you, you know, I, I have a lot of leeway, yeah. so yeah. we'll just go with that. Um, here so we are. Here we week. are. Another week. We skipped the show last week. We're sorry. It was snowing. We were lazy. It's true. We were going to do Zoom. We were going to do Zoom, and then we and got distracted. And honestly, like you know, it, just getting like, out there, doing the snow, yeah. all of that. Just it was kinda, busy, and it's going to be busy. Yeah. It's a lot of snow this week. It's There's going to be so many well, bills too. Oh like I'm signing in for stuff, yeah. and it's just non. So while we're just even signing in, so anybody who's interested in um, chiming in on any piece of legislation that's currently um, has a hearing scheduled. You can go to the um, general court website, which is gencourt, G-E-N-C-O-U-R-T dot state dot N-H dot U-S. And I usually just search for N-H gencourt and it comes right up. And what, the easiest way I found to find things is to um, go to the current calendar and then scroll down and they've got hyperlinks right in there, which is nice. And then it clicks on it and asks you what your name is and whether you're supporting and so on. So you can actually... Um, chime in a lot easier than when you had to actually just be there in person. Right. And I'm actually, you know, I'm a big fan of tech. So I kind of feel like, well, maybe there is a way we can hack some of this and improve systems. Mm. It makes it easier for, you know, a lot of our citizen legislature yeah. is older, yep. you know, so it's a long drive. Some people are coming from the North yep. country, all that stuff. So I kind of like this model. Yeah, I'm not... But, totally. but they still have to vote. Well, so several things. Like, I think what we should do is we should do a hard push to say, this is how we want these uh, hearings. hearings to work. So first of all, the public should testify first and longest on everything, right? They're making bills against the public or for the public. The four I don't often see, right? So they should they should get the time. It should be New Hampshire residents. Yeah. Well, so there was a bill last week that was on the education yep. savings accounts, yep. and I assume we're going to talk about it yep. in a second. But there were over 3,000 people or 6,000 yeah. people who signed in. 3,000. Union people from other states yeah. and then there were 600 local granite staters who signed yeah. in to say hey we really want this we want to actually you know all of us are paying in yeah all of us are paying in so if someone can explain to me other than the excuse of the unions want theirs why we wouldn't let the money follow the child so on that subject i spent the morning i i always felt like i had a fairly good um thumb on the pulse of how our funding works in the state and then I always doubt myself <laughs> and it does change so I decided I would do some background and I would share some of it with you um I made two gra I brought in two graphics one um Brendan's gonna stick up here is about how the state adequacy money is you hear about that all the time um this this graph that you're looking at right now is where the state money so this is the money that comes from the statewide property tax which you see as a separate line on your um tax bill it'll say state education and there's a line all that money gets pulled together and this is how the per student breakdown is it starts with a base of three thousand seven hundred eighty six dollars and sixty six cents for every kid that is um in school, in school. Homeschoolers don't get it. Charter school students don't get it. Which is funny. Which is weird because they're public schools, but whatever. Schools. But I think that's the trade-off they made. We won't take the adequacy money and we won't, we won't be required to do certain things. But that's okay. Uh, then there are differentiated numbers that depend on the student themselves. The first one is for anybody who's eligible for uh, reduced or free lunch. It's based on the income the income of the family, not on whether they participate in free or reduced lunch. So it's basically a, um, this changes based on economic status. So lower income students get more state adequacy money, $1,893.22. Okay. Then if um, a student has an IEP and there's, um, you know, there's a learning disability of some sort or whatever, that's a $2,037.11. Then there is two 
different lines. Um, both of them are $740.87. One is if you're an English language learner. So if you're, you know, English isn't your first language, they give Black you extra. Me. <laughs> and the other one, which is kind of a backwards one, um, awards it to students who at the third grade level are not proficient in reading. So think about that in a way. The school gets more money if the third graders can't read. So, so they really have no incentive to, to right. They yeah. they don't have an incentive to really push the reading until fourth grade. So that's kind of backwards. But anyways, the total of that, as you can see, if there was a student that re was low income, had an IEP, English as a second language, and not proficient in reading in third grade, they could get $9,198.73 per student. But the average across New Hampshire is about $4,600. That's the number you hear about so often. Um, then you, sometimes you'll hear about federal aid. From what I understand, federal money is only about 3% of the total cost. Now, here in Manchester, um, our per pupil spending is $12,434. That's on an average over all of our grades, what we spend. So if the average... Mm, I saw 16000 on Well, it depends on... It, mm. it, it, um, not necessarily in Manchester. 16000 might be the average across the state. No, I'm pretty sure there was a John DePietro chart from hmm. last week that okay. was well, uh, th for Manchester Yeah, I think he does have that... I just took this from the Board of Education. So I'm being gener I'm being very conservative on what we right. spend. We might actually spend thousands more. Um, what is kind of interesting, and I didn't really look at this too, too closely, is in addition to that adequacy money that comes from the state, there's a, um, a stabilization grant that was established in 2012 because that's when we started doing the adequacy money. And the purpose of the stabilization grant was to stabilize those communities that were going to get less funding than they used to get. Of course, we haven't actually reduced the stabilization, so we haven't actually required Manchester, for example, to adjust the way we do things for the adequate the funding we get. In the, the this fiscal budget in, I believe it's tw fiscal year 2022, it's expected to give 100% of the 2012 stabilization grant. So what, what does that mean? Well, in 2012, we had probably 3,000 more students than we currently have. So Manchester is still getting help based on students we had in 2012 that we no longer have. There was a bill that probably shortly after, I'm gonna guess 2014, 2015, where the towns were like, this is insane. Basically, we're getting help for the students that used to go to West who now go to Bedford. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all, I say it all the time, but you know, my sentiment at this stage is, it's all pretty broken. Maybe we can use 2021 and an opportunity out of 2020 to say, hey, you know, it was a rough year. I think it was a rough yep. year for everyone, but maybe there's good that can come out of this. I think that, you know, the fact that the parochial schools and the religious schools have been open yep. with no problem for the entire time, the fact that the unions are saying they're unwilling to teach um, is, should be judged harshly. I think people should look at this and go, um, it's time to change things, to well, shake things up a little bit. And honestly, it doesn't seem that radical no, to me it really... to say, look, we're spending X amount of money. The, the, the point of educating children isn't to put them in daycare and have a place to park your kids. You want your kids to be able to thrive. read and thrive, mm -hmm. have friends. And you know what? If you talk to most kids, they're not missing school they're missing or their, learning. The they're missing their friends. They're missing the social component that is incredibly important for kids' development. Yep. And I know because I have a lot of friends who are homeschooling or unschooling or whatever <laughs> charter schooling or whatever their kids, right? And they have tons of those social 
events yep. where they go to a museum together yep. or they go do something. So I saw a great meme <laughs> this week that basically said, parents, pay attention. Does your kid not have stomach aches anymore? Right. And I was like, yeah, that's because the thing, stress. right? Because well, stress, but also just the excuse of saying, yeah, I don't want to go. I don't want to go to I school. I can't say I got a fever because mom's going to figure that hack out. <laughs> so, oh, my tummy hurts, right? So there's this bill, HB 20, which is to establish education freedom accounts, um, which is basically would take the state adequacy money and instead of giving it to the school district, would allow the parents who choose, it would com completely be a choice, um, to use to pay for learning for their children. Now, currently, we have basically three options for education in the state. We have our public schools, which are your traditional schools and your charter schools. You have um, non-public schools, which are the parochial schools, and then you have home education. Those three things exist now. Um, there are different criteria for each because they're all individual. An education freedom account would establish a fourth option. One of the things that I kept looking to see what why people were getting so caught up with it is I'm seeing a lot of pushback from people in the homeschool communities saying that these education freedom accounts somehow were going to hurt them and require them to do something that they don't currently have to do. And I'll tell you, I pulled out the bill this morning and I cert uh, the RSA is RSA 193. Um, there's a section on the requirements for um, attendance. And actually, I did put it here. It says, um, 193.1 says, a parent of any child at least six years of age and under 18 shall cause such child to attend a, the public school to which the child is assigned in the child's resident district. Such child shall attend full-time when school is in session unless. And then it lists off all the ones. If you're in a private school, if you go to school, let's see, all these things. And the second one is the child is receiving home education pursuant to RSA 193A and is therefore exempt. So... 193.1 says, if you're homeschooled, you are not required for this daily uh, attendance requirement. Nothing in HB 20 changes that. The only thing that changes in it, as a result of HB 20 would be this fourth option of an education freedom account kid. Now, if they chose to be an EFA kid, they could homeschool, get that money, but then there would be requirements attached to it. Well, that's what they're concerned but about. That is not the homeschool kids that are. But they, but but so the homeschoolers are saying we pay into the system. We would like our money back yes, to educate our but, children. So what they're saying is, if we take the money now, you're putting yes, us. But under you don't some have to take the money any more than you take the money now. You're not. What I'm getting at is this bill doesn't harm the whole homeschoolers. It just doesn't do what the homeschooling community would like it to do. They would like to also keep their money, keep that money, which I can understand, <laughs> but I'm just saying this bill does not do a single thing to current homeschool regulations. Nothing. Well, it doesn't, but it also does not benefit it, homeschoolers. I don't who disagree would want with you, but it doesn't the harm money. them. They don't get the money now, they wouldn't get the money after, unless they decided to be part of an EF, the EFA program. So I don't think that's a reason to oppose improving things for a large number I mean, of kids in it, New Hampshire. It, it probably isn't a reason. And I mean, one of the frustrating things, of course, with any kind of legislation is just simply it's constantly compromised. The sausage is really gross. <laughs> You know, the saying of you know, how yeah. they make the sausage up there. Um, and so, I mean, I do understand that concern, right? So you're like, well, why wouldn't I be able to get... Right. Because it's about if, let's put it this way, if it is about children learning to the best of their abilities, then they should get the money. Okay, so... and But, you know, but going back to how that sausage is made... This legislation is to establish something that doesn't exist that would benefit the vast number of students in this state. I definitely, I mean, I signed in and supported it. You know it. what I mean? I, I get I, that it's not all legislations like that. Yeah, but it doesn't do this. Yeah, but it doesn't. <laughs> so then, well, but the next best thing is you pass this. It doesn't 
harm homeschoolers. They don't get what they hoped for, but it doesn't do a darn thing to their lives at all, except there's other options on the table then. Then you go back another right. year. But, I mean, I would also say, sure, sure. So, so we, we, we uh, punish the freedom people who are paying into the system mm -hmm. and tell them, okay, if you want to opt out of the system, we're going to take your money, taxation is theft, and then we're going to be like, oh, you're SOL, right? So that's fine. But I do think it is a legitimate position for homeschoolers and taxpayers to say, it's my money. I agree. And I guess I go back to the, I would not let um, perfect be the yes. enemy of good. Yes. But then, you know, I mean, talking about the sausage being made, one of the bills that I've looked at, um, I haven't actually signed in to testify if, if I get my druthers together today, maybe I will. But I see there's this hard push suddenly to do uh, body cam statewide for the police. And this is just going to be awesome. And, and I was like, that seems a little suspicious. I wonder if the people who are promoting this bill know that all body cam footage is actually exempt from 91A. From 91A and from disclosure. So the way I'm looking at that kind of stuff where it seems it sounds good, like but then you're like, people are wait. making things better, but when you really just scratch under the surface, you're like, are we? And I have to say, I'm feeling that way about the ombudsman bill as yeah. well, right? So that's the right to know bill that we said, okay, the courts are too slow. It takes too long. Everyone's using excuses. They're redacting. They're just saying no, like all that stuff, mm -hmm. right? So, oh, let's in introduce this ombudsman uh, bill. And it would be, you know, you could go through the ombudsman or you can go, if you don't like that decision, you can still go to the courts. Yep. Or you can say, I don't want to go to the ombudsman. I want to go to the right. courts. But this is probably going to grow government a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I might say I saw something where, you know, it was people saying from from the state agency side saying, this is going to be great. We can't right. wait to get our guy in right. and just right. suppress then, the and right last away, bit of openness And right away it's have. like, oh, wait, you want yeah. it? I don't know if I want this anymore. So, so, so you know, I think that's part of those frustrations. Sometimes I go, oh, I'm glad I'm not there where I don't have to be this, you know, um, vested because a lot of it is just bad. You know what well, I would love to see is we just take a five-year hiatus on writing any new bills and just get rid of the best stuff and, that's and on just there. start yeah. to sunset well i used to nonsense. say that two things <laughs> one I, I i would love to see somebody put in a bill to mandate a sunset clause on every piece of every law and people go well why would you want to do that are you going to let murder you know no yeah, it, yes it would sunset and it would immediately be re-upped you know there are things that would not but it also can people but it would be stop. a good point to review with the with like the straw man arguments yeah. where people go oh if you don't want someone to regulate the way you fold your toilet paper <laughs> on the roll over or under i mean i'm exaggerating but right there are literally bills that are in the minutia of life that really just yeah. is it's no one's business and it's certainly not the government's nope. business right so, so people will be like, we really don't need that law, or that's absurd, or why are we legislating people's toilets, bathrooms, you know, bedrooms, Septics, sex this, lives, yeah. you know, like all that stuff, right? And then people immediately go to the most, the most extreme, extreme thing. other side of things, and that is not how the oh, world works. And no one who says we want less laws wants murder right. to be legal. Well, and it's <laughs> and if you think about it, if there was a sunset on every single. RSA. You would know after com com one, somebody would actually it, be tasked with reviewing stuff instead of it just building up and building up and the RSA is growing and growing and they conflict with each other. And there's always a, and, and a lot of stuff does become out of date because it's just not relevant anymore. Or maybe it needs to be amended because we're talking about telephones when we really need to say electronic communicate, you know, like, right. Right. It would be a good thing. And so I would love to see, I've always said, I'd love to see a two term, two year term um, that the first year is based on the budget, which gives everybody that's new their legs mm -hmm. on how legislation works. And maybe they spend that first year of every two year term just cleaning up that section that that committee deals with. And then the second year we can talk about. And, and, you know, there's, Actual legislation. there is a right to know bill that is currently uh, being uh, 
pushed through where one of the things we're looking for is to say, if you have sealed minutes, right? So sometimes uh, a committee or you know a board has to go into non-public session. It is a process that is being wildly abused, yes. right? So that's basically everything's supposed to be in the public. Our government's supposed to be open, transparent, responsive, and accountable to the people. You know, we may quibble if that's the case. And um, and so a lot of things are being pushed into non-public mm -hmm. session, mm -hmm. right? And then they seal the minutes. Now suddenly we have no idea what happened. So one of the bills is just to say, actually, we need after to know what every the subject year, no, well, that's part of it. But after every year, they have to get together and they have to un seal the minutes because they're no longer explain relevant why it that's is that's fair because sealed. if it's if it's a um because sometimes it's property prices or, or there's or, um negoti legal negotiation that obviously you wouldn't want that to be in public because that would give whoever suing well them. i mean we, we we say maybe we would want the police disciplinary yes. decertifications to yes. be public because but there's that seems you know, like or it's like the nego interest. union negotiations because you don't want your nego you're making your case over here. You can't be like, hey, every, on the other side, here's our... But you're right. After a year or two years or some period right. of time, the privacy needs of those me meetings no longer are relevant. I mean, I will tell you, there's a part of me that is inclined to almost be like, wow, like I know a lot of techies, right? And I'm just at the stage where I'm like, maybe we can build some kind of software that would just help everyone be more transparent. You know, I've been watching this uh, Lori Ortolano out of oh, Nashua, right? And that's, woman. that's the lady who, you know, had a problem with the accessors, started, and she's basically doing grassroots work, helping people to see whether, uh, you know, their assessment is correct or whether they're eligible, say, for a tax abatement. If you're an elderly person and you're on a fixed income, sometimes you could do it. There were two things that I didn't know about her story. One is apparently in her right to know request, which makes all the stuff about the cops showing up yep, at her yep. house or being escorted out of places, yep. like all of that, makes a lot more sense when you learn that she actually discovered that a lot of very well-connected people mm -hmm. in Nashua all had very favorable tax yes. abatements yes. on their property. So that's the kind of stuff, yeah. right? Where it's like that is de facto corruption. And if you're going to do that for the special connected people, let's do it for everyone. Well, and imagine this, or we just stop basing our tax assessments on value and just go with square footage and acreage. I like that. Well, I mean, it would be so up, easy. It's a, it's a spreadsheet at that point. So you know what we should do? We should come up with a 10 point plan and we should get a bunch of candidates to be like, this, this is, is what a, we're running on. We're running on, we're going to sunset every law. We're running on full government transparency. We'll buy, you know, we'll build, I will build, I will have my friends build a database of some sort that we can all access that just makes the information public automatically because part of what happens is these people are just they don't know right. no one knows what they're doing because there are too many it's laws. too hard yeah. and it's too hard to find the info i mean to be honest just looking up the stuff on education funding this morning and the things i was like I know all this. I know this in my head. And I'm like, okay, now where can I go find that bit of information? So in that bill, how much are they proposing? Are they proposing the adequacy? So it's the 3,800-ish? No, it's or? the four, It's the full, all the statewide funding money would go okay. with the student. Now, and the, the, the homeschoolers have their issue. And then, um, of course, the big scare tactic is that this would decimate the public school system because, but it's just But are we supporting a system or well, are we supporting kids but it learning? Wouldn't, it wouldn't even do that though because like, okay, in Manchester, they spend $12,434 per pupil every year. Even if they, if they take that $4,600 away from the school district, they still get like $7,800 still left of my property taxes, but with one less student. So if 100 students leave, you'd have seven, what, 700 and, I don't even, can't even do the math. Isn't that awful? 7,800, you'd have $780,000 of extra money to, to educate the kids that are left. Now, the, the big problem as we know it, because we can see it in Manchester, is that they do, Manchester does not adapt to the number of students we have in our school. It is blatantly obvious we are thousands of students lower. And, and I, we won't even go into it, but it's like, well, here goes the spending and here goes the students. And, and the scare tactic is if you take this go. little bit of money away, it's going to 
just decimate it. everybody. Because here's the thing. It's it's government at its very base is like rewarding bad behavior yep. over and over and over again. Yep. Incentives matter, right? And with the education system we've put together and the way this is structured, it is it's it's junk. Well, it is junk at this stage and the board of uh, well, Manchester. Schools, oh. Yeah, the, the the school board in Manchester. They had that independent study that came out. It was done by consultants that they picked yeah. with data that they gave them, and then, and then they they're used like, "Oh, but that's not real." Data, and they came to an outcome which makes perfect sense. That if we have vast declining enrollment, <laughs> we need to cut back. Duh. And now the school board is like, oh, wait, oh, that's no, not, that's not you what we wanted. To, we, you, you gave us the wrong answer, so now you need to, and now they're literally just trying to fudge the, 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 well, the so report what, here's and the outcome, and that's... Even funnier, I sit down here and there's a screen here that we don't ever use, but apparently people who tape other shows do. And up here, I see this spreadsheet that yeah. says reduction considerations to meet the tax cap. And I'm like, well, isn't that interesting? So this must be from the school board saying um, where they're going to, how the the superintendent plans to come up with a budget that meets, stays within the tax cap. The funniest thing of it all, there's all this stuff, um, other reductions, uh, they want to take two million dollars from the expendable trust for health insurance. What I don't really think that's why there's money in a trust account for health insurance to put oh. into the school budget. That's just not how this works. And um, but, but Tammy, yeah. I mean, it's 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 like on a federal level when we talk about social security. You know, one of the ironies no one's talking about at the moment. You know, I honestly I fear for some form of a dollar collapse that is coming soon because you can't keep going into debt and running up the credit cards with money we don't have while having an entire half of the country saying we want everything to be free so we're like how many trillions i mean i think social security currently is you know unfunded uh, just debt service for the school but is apparently 11 million plus five wow 5.7 percent of our school budget is on debt services so, so basically, I mean, what I'm saying is the, the, the people running the show are running stuff into the ground. And maybe it is time for people who actually understand what the problems are to try and solve them. And I will say this. This is my way, one line summary on education. You're either for the kids or you're not. And we're for the kids. And I'm for the kids. <laughs> That's all we got. We'll come back next week. Anyways, you can check out uh, the General Court website, and you can also go to Education. Oh, that's not it. Shoot. All right, while well, she's finding that, buy my book, The Ecstatic Pessimist, now on Amazon and on my website, CarlaGarrick.com. Maybe it is. Education. Oh, that's not it. You can search for, it's EducationFreedomNH.com. EducationFreedomNH.com has some great information about the EFA accounts, um, EFA students, and how it would impact New Hampshire. Um, apparently, they did a survey, and 71% of parents approve of this idea. 71%. Anyways. And two more here. That's right. Thanks, That's guys. That's all we got. See you next week. Bye.